Before we get started, we'd like to remind you about our Relationship 101 workshop on Saturday, December 8th in Brooklyn that will guide you through self-exploration to deepen your relationship with yourself and find intimacy with others. Purchase tickets by visiting lovelink.co. As a disclaimer, this episode of Lovelink was recorded over the phone. Unfortunately, the sound quality isn't perfect, but hang in there. It's worth a listen. I want people to know that love makes sense and that you can shape it and you don't have to be overwhelmed by it and just give up on it. You know, that you can understand this incredible dance. Welcome to Lovelink, your guide to love and sex in all forms. We're your hosts, Simone Humphrey and Sina Simon. Our guest today is a researcher and author who specializes in couples therapy. She's the developer of emotion-focused couples and family therapy and author of the best-selling book, Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. Among her many accomplishments, she has been appointed as a member of the Order of Canada and was named Psychologist of the Year by the American Psychological Association in 2016. Here to talk to us today about how the science of attachment can help couples reconnect and create safety is Dr. Sue Johnson. Sue Johnson, welcome to the podcast. Hey, I'm pleased to be here. Nice to speak with you guys. Thanks for joining us. We kind of wanted to get started just by hearing a little bit about how you got interested in studying romantic relationships. I think I got interested in relationships because the one of the huge facts of my young life was that my parents, um, it was clear to me they loved each other. I, I understood that even as a very young child. And it was also clear to me that they were destroying each other. And I found that fascinating and horrifying and the conclusion I came to was that the one thing I was never going to do was get married (laughs) so uh, because obviously um, nobody knew how to do what I was watching this drama was you know hugely overwhelming for everyone and my granny told me, I think I've written this somewhere, it might have been in Love Sense, I can't remember. I said, what is wrong with them to my granny when I sat on the stairs in the dark listening to them fight? I think I was about six. And my granny said something like, they love each other, dear. And um, I said, well, then I'm not doing that and they don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Insightful <laughs> for a young child. Yeah, insightful. And I also lived, I grew up in a pub in England and there were no rules in those days about kids not being in pubs or not helping out. So I was a working class kid, so I was given a stool to stand on and a task to do. I would wash the glasses and and wipe them and put them on the shelves. So um, when other kids were sort of playing with their toys, you know, I was watching adults. Mm. I was watching adults, often quite inebriated, flirt and fight. And um, I think it sort of, it always fascinated me, this drama, intense personal dramas always fascinated me. You know, and at one point I, I went into literature and I went into theatre. You know, I was an actress for a very short time. And it was the same stuff. The parts I wanted to play were the intense personal dramas, the stories I wanted to read about. So I was always sort of hooked by this. I was also hooked by the fact that it was obvious to me that nobody knew anything about love. Then I, as a young therapist, I sort of did everything else except couple therapy. And I thought I was... Uh, pretty hot as a therapist you know when you're young and you, you, you say oh wow I can do this I'm I can, I'm just so good at this right so you I thought I was pretty hot 
And then suddenly my last um, sort of assignment in my, in my clinical doctoral program was that I had to work with all these couples. And for various reasons, um, I was given a lot of couples to work with instead of theoretically I only had to look at work with three. But I went into this clinic and they said, oh, you're pretty experienced. So we're going to give you like, you know, 16 couples to work with. And so I thought it's going to be fine. You know, I said, it'll be fine. So I, I w walked into these couple sessions and it was awful. And I had, and it did all the nice things that I'd learned to do with families, with uh, sitting with social workers, talking to families and individuals, just seemed to go nowhere. The couples either wouldn't speak to each other, got enraged with me because I wasn't taking sides, or attacked each other all the time. And I just felt like, you know, um, sort of a bump in the middle of an intersection with busy traffic everywhere. And I thought, I don't know how to do this. And, and then I realized, I don't think anyone knows how to do this. So I started, you know, um, taping my couples and watching them. And gradually, gradually, I got transfixed, fascinated, enthralled, amazed. And then I started watching moments of change. I stopped trying to persuade them to be different. When I stopped trying to teach them skills or give them insight, when I just listen to their emotions and hold them in the emotion and um, listen to them and help them speak to each other in a different way, help them relate to the emotion in a different way, the music changes. And when the music changes in this dance, everything starts to shift. All these behaviors, all these set ways of seeing your partner, all these catastrophic cognitions, suddenly they all seem to shift. Then I was completely hooked. And I just kind of got... Obsessed, I guess is the word you could use, and started working with my students at the University of Ottawa, doing studies, taping couples, writing out. I was so obsessed, I would take my couples and write out the transcripts of therapy, right, and look at so I could see the patterns more and more clearly. And I would watch when change happens and when it didn't happen. And the whole thing suddenly started to have a life of its own and has swept me along. So we know that EFT is one of the most evidence-based forms of couples therapy that it's shown to have immense success. Why do you think it was so difficult to have successful couples therapy? I mean, you mentioned this piece about difficulty accepting emotion and difficulty accepting this kind of healthy codependency, but why, why was it so difficult to find effective forms of couples treatment historically? I think the bottom line is if you do not understand the drama that you're watching, if you do not understand the territory called intimate bonded relationships, then chances are you're going to, you know, it's kind of like if you don't understand you're looking at an elephant you know, you're going to get obsessed with um, some little part of the elephant. I think uh, couple therapy, couple therapists in general got trapped in addressing one symptom or another of the distress, right? And, and they might help a couple for a few sessions. But most of the time, um, you know, the couple therapy was considered very difficult. Of course, it's difficult if you don't have a map. You know, you're leaping into this incredible drama, right, where people feel like their lives are at stake, right? So, and of course, it's difficult. So people didn't have a map, and they would get caught in trying to change little pieces, like tell people to be nice to each other, basically. <laughs> uh, tell, trying to change their communication skills. The tricky part about that is um, when you're, um, not able to connect with somebody and you don't feel safe with them and your mammalian bonding brain is starting to panic, you're not very good at communication skills. 
even if you've practiced them a thousand times, wrong channel, wrong moment, right? They would give couples insights. And insights are great until your emotions really get triggered. You know, I have all kinds of, it, it, believe it or not, it's my 30th wedding anniversary today. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Yes, it's quite funny. So I have all kinds of insights into my amazing partner, <laughs> who is an amazing partner. Um, but if we're in the middle of one of our, thank goodness, not terribly frequent uh, now, fights, um, I, I completely lose sight of those insights. And, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, I get to a place where I feel like he's being a jerk. And, and then I, you know, generalize and find all kinds of memories of moments of jerkiness. <laughs> mm-hmm. And wipe out all the amazing times when he's been, you know, an amazing partner. And everything... I lose my perspective. I lose my emotional balance is what I lose. Mm. And then things all start to go wrong. The point is, though, um, that in a good relationship, you can recover from that. You can, uh, you have enough trust and you can find your emotional balance enough to turn back towards each other and really look at each other again and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I say to myself, wait a minute, this is John, I'm, who am I talking about in my head? <laughs> mm. Like I'm having this conversation with myself in my head, which we all do in relationships, you know. Who am I talking about? This is, this is John that I'm talking about. And he's not deliberately trying to do me in, right? Who, what happened here? So then you go back to what happened here. And actually... That comes up, but that's where I start with couples too. What's happening here? I'm, I say to couples, I'm going to slow you down here. Could you help me? What's happening here? Let's look at this. I look at the dance between them, whereas most people who come into therapy, they're looking at, they're trying to protect themselves and they're watching their partner, they're vigilant, and they're just looking at what their partner's doing to them right? They don't see the dance at all. Can you talk a little bit about the different dances that couples can get into? Because I think this is a really important concept for a lot of people because many times they think, oh, the difficulties in my relationship are because of some concrete issue or what this other person is doing or our life circumstances. And you lose sight of this the uh, the pattern that, that you're getting into with your partner. Can you talk about what the different patterns can look like for couples? But I think what's important first is for us to understand that from the point of view of bonding science, you know, which basically says that love, romantic love, is not a mixture of sex and sentiment. It's an ancient wired in survival code that's built into your nervous system where connection is safe, connection is safety, and disconnection is makes you vulnerable. It's, a, it's, a, it's dangerous, right? So let's just set that up. And um, what we need to get is that most couple therapists have been taught that the problem in relationships is conflict. And if you're an attachment theorist, which all EFTers, you know, that's the basis of EFT. I think it's the reason why EFT is so successful we have a map we know we know what's going on in this drama if you're an attachment person you understand that the key issue is emotional disconnection that the key issue in relationships key question is are you there for me if i call will you come if i need you if i need support reassurance to need to know that my pain matters to somebody that i matter to someone are you going to be there right? That's the multi-million dollar question in relationships. And what happens in distress is somebody wants this sense of connection or senses disconnection in the relationship and they try to reconnect. They don't even often know what they're doing. It's just sort of an automatic process. They try to reconnect and it doesn't work. And this dance gets going that triggers both people's fear of um, really their fear of rejection and their fear of aloneness, being abandoned. 
And then this whole dance gets set up. So the classic one in North America is somebody feels somehow disconnected. Danny asks his wife to make love, right? Danny only really feels safe when he has very, very regular sexual contact with his wife. He has a lot of insecurities um, in the relationship. He asks his wife to make love and she rolls her eyes. She rolls her eyes and says, oh, you know, not now. Okay. So for her, that is, you know, it's like, it's, it's just a moment. It's just a moment for him. This triggers catastrophic fears in him. They are, you see, they are, you see, she doesn't desire me. I'm never sure she really wants me. It triggers all these fears. And the he goes into the classic demand pattern, right? Where it's all driven by his anxiety, where he says, so, so, oh, I see. So you don't want to make love, you know, and you, you roll your eyes at me like I don't matter. And you don't want to, and you didn't make love to me yesterday either. You know, and there's something wrong with you. He becomes pushy, demanding, upset, angry. And from her point of view, he's attacking her. So what does she do? She protects herself. He be, he's become dangerous. There's lots of evidence that for human beings, criticism from someone you're close to is an incredibly aversive stimulus. Your brain says that it's dangerous. Okay. It's, it registers in the same part of your brain in the same way as physical pain. So that's just because we're, ma we're bonding mammals. That's how you're wired. So she sees him as dangerous. She turns away. She shuts down. She says, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you. You're impossible. <laughs> right. She shuts down, she shuts him out. The more she shuts him out, the more he's triggered, the more upset, the more overwhelmed with anxiety he becomes, the pushier he becomes. Finally, you look at them, they're in a horrible fight where he's accusing her of being sexually inadequate, frigid, you know, impossible, a bad partner. And she is walking out on him and telling him she should never have married him anyway. Right. And this is an extreme demand withdrawal pattern. Um, it doesn't have to be this extreme for it to be amazingly distressing in relationships. Because bottom line is, uh, you know, all couples can get stuck in this occasionally, but the couples you see in your office are caught in it. And it's what happens is, the dance starts to become automatic. People get more and more easily triggered. They only know one set of steps to do in the dance. The dance starts to take over the relationship and they get stuck in it. And after a while, the dance does them. So um, Danny becomes more and more sensitive to any kind of sense of rejection. He pushes for sex more and more. She um, sees him as impossible and demanding. She re re she withdraws from him faster and faster. You know, and they come into my office, and um, she's clinically depressed, and Danny is talking about divorce. Mm. So this is the, the demand withdrawal is the classic, but people usually they get there's a, people also get caught um, in what I call find the bad guy. Brief, they're short usually because they're so aversive, attack, attack patterns. And if you listen to them, it's always about we're completely disconnected. I don't know how to connect with you, so I've given up on it, and I'm going for the booby prize. The booby prize is it's not my fault. <laughs> okay. Classic. So if, if it's not my fault, it's your fault. So there's nothing wrong with me, right? Mm. And that's a booby prize because, of course, it's not actually very useful for you to prove that the person that you're trying to connect with is a complete creep. <laughs> <laughs> then, you're, then you're married to a complete creep. Right. But, you know, it's like but we do it. It's, it feels it's a bid for control. So you can get fast escalating attack attacks and what we do in EFT is we, we do what we do with every cycle. We slow it down. We slow, if you're going to work with strong emotion, 
you have to know how to slow it down. We slow it down. We reflect the dance. We, we talk about how they're caught in the dance, that the anger or the fear has taken over, and we help them see the dance. And as we do that, we help them regulate their emotions, change the music. The third one, so you've got, you know, uh, find the bad guy, attack, attack. You've got demand, withdraw. And the one that you see less often in couples therapy is um, some version of um, withdraw, withdraw. And often that's when people are giving up. Somebody's been pursuing somebody for years and finally something happens and they say, they start to grieve the relationship. It's interesting, often they, they report they've had a period of depression and I see it in terms of grieving. They start to grieve the relationship and they shut down and they stop trying. And suddenly this enormous absence of connection becomes, you, people just can't avoid it anymore. They just see it. They just, they, you know, it's in, in their face. And suddenly somebody says, let's go see a therapist. And what you get is they talk to you about their relationship in a kind of detached, distant way, like they're talking about a movie. And nobody's actually dancing. I, I said to one couple a few years ago, you know what, guys? You want me to change how you dance together, but nobody's actually out on the floor right now, are they? You know, you, you're looking out the window talking about something that happened years ago, and you're sort of talking about a relationship like it's sort of happening to someone else. Could you help me? Uh, nobody's really out on the dance floor here what's happening it's like you guys have both shut down maybe you're giving up here and the man um turned to me and said oh right yes you've got it that's what's happening um because i'm not going to do it i'm not going to do it so it's so interesting when you tune into people and eft is all about attunement and if you have a map to relationships, it's easier to tune in. When you tune into people, people are so relieved to be understood. They respond to you, right? So he, he says to me, that's right, you've got it, you've got it. I'm not going to do it anymore. I say, could you help me? What is it that you're not going to do? He says, I'm not going to come out. I'm not going to come out so she can prove that I'm just the big disappointment all over again. I can't do it anymore. And his face is filled with pain, mm. right? So he's opened a door. So then I walk in. <laughs> so, and, and if you're an EFT therapist, you walk in with validation and respect and caring. You start where people are, not where you think they should be. So I say, I understand. Could you help me? What you're telling me is that something's happened in this relationship and you are always waiting for this message, this, and it must be an incredibly painful message, that somehow you're not the person your lady wants, that you can't please her. Is that what's happening for you? And he looks at me and he looks at me and his eyes fill with tears, and he starts to talk. You know, we, in EFT, we have never had problems with withdrawers, really. I remember somebody saying to me when we first started doing studies, well, you know, this is a therapy for women, you know, but men don't want to talk about their feelings, and you can't do this with men. This is absolutely nonsense. Even our research results in one of our studies said that EFT was particularly effective with men who talked about they can't talk about their feelings and whose wives said that they couldn't talk about their feelings. Yeah. <laughs> because if you know what feelings are there and you know that they make sense mm -hmm. and you know how to make it safe and evoke them, they, the door just opens. It's, you have to know they're there. You have to... And this is the point. We've learned over the years to work with these emotions, what the emotions are, how, how to put them together. We talk about assembling emotion these days. We help people assemble the elements of their emotion. We help them make sense of their emotion. 
we uh, help them regulate and tolerate their emotions, and then we work with the most powerful thing in the room, which is undoubtedly people's emotions in a relationship. And, you know, we use emotions to change the dance, to change what's going on in the couple. Mm. But you have to you have to have a certain trust that you can do that. From my point of view, one of the big mistakes in couples therapy in general is that people don't want to work with emotions. They're they're intimidating or they don't know how, they don't know how to tune in and work with the emotion and change the music. If you're gonna change a dance between intimates, you have to change the emotional music. There's no way that I can teach you to do um, a, a samba when you're listening to tango music. It's just not gonna happen. And that's really the power of EFT. You know, I imagine it's such a relief for couples when they really get to that place of emotion in a safe way. And particularly for the pursuer when they know more about what the withdrawer is experiencing. That it's both a relief for the withdrawer to come out and share, but also a relief for them to know what's happening. Absolutely. You know, I mean, one of the things that happens is you know, um, for example, when, when somebody who's been demanding and pursuing and saying, where are you, where are you, where are you, and they put it together that you don't care about me or you're indifferent or, right, suddenly when they realize, when they hear their partner saying, I'm afraid of your disapproval, that's why I turn away from you. you know, first, sometimes you have to let them struggle with that. They, you know, first of all, they say, really? <laughs> you know, uh, really uh i don't believe that you know but um you have to help them a bit because it's new for them but in fact it is a relief that's exactly the word you know people say ah wait a minute you mean you're you i thought i wasn't having any, any impact on you at all but you mean you're actually scared uh, you you see me as disappointed with you and criticizing you and you move away because that scares you? Oh, see, and listen to the message in that. Oh, then I do matter. You know, it's not in a particularly good way right now, but I do have impact on you, not the impact I want to have, but oh, you know, you're not indifferent or mean or, you know, uncaring. I'm actually scaring you. And I think the key thing to realize is that, um, Couples have no idea, really, the impact they're having on each other. And we as a society, we like, we don't, we have no idea um, how impactful these relationships are and how basically we're vulnerable in love and we scare the hell out of each other. And, you know, and then it's all about how we deal with that fear. I mean, EFT is about creating constructive dependency. It's about showing people how to accept their vulnerability and deal with it in a way that pulls the other person close. And that's what people do in the second stage of it. We help people de-escalate their negative patterns. And then in the second stage of EFT, we help them have these hold me tight conversations that really shift the relationship. I'm not just saying that. We have nine studies that shows that these conversations shift people out of distress and that they predict relationship satisfaction years down the road. So these are powerful conversations. But if you look at what happens in these hold me tight conversations, people understand their vulnerability in a new way. They can tolerate it and they can actually put it into words in a way that helps their partner tune into it and respond to it. And that is what you do in a positive bonding relationship you know we we bond so easily with children and dogs and i think it's because particularly with our dogs because dogs are safe for goodness there's no risk of rejection yeah exactly i don't think my dog has ever rejected me in the last you know since he was a he, no he's never rejected me I mean, he, <laughs> but his heart he's always totally loving and accepting even when i'm being mean to him you know so <laughs> it's the perfect relationship it is a perfect relationship that's why we love our dogs 
you know, but children too, you know, their vulnerability is obvious. But then somehow when we get into these adult relationships, we have such a hard time in our society with acknowledging how vulnerable we are to other people, especially to the ones that we count on and depend on. You know, half of our movies are all about invulnerability. Mm. You know, I'm a, you know, suddenly being having superpowers. You know, I'm whatever you do to me, you know, you can't do me in, you can't defeat me, you can't. I think it's fascinating that all those movies are coming out at a time when um, in Western society, the evidence is we're feeling more and more isolated, more and more alone. Why do you think we're so afraid of vulnerability in our culture in particular? That's a very good, huge, fascinating question. <laughs> um, I, I could answer it a thousand different ways. Um, I think it's because we had a whole culture, especially in North America, there's a whole culture of, you know, you have to stand up and fight the elements you have to there's about it's about independence it's about power it's about standing and your know, life is a battle and you you have to try and win it and you have to you can't count on anyone else there's a whole culture around that a whole culture of independence and you know it's a in lots of ways it's a male culture that's how we've told we've told men you have to perform you have to be strong you you have to deal with your vulnerability you know on your own this is what this is what we've sold men and i think men have been victimized by this but you know it's been considered female you know to be just to, to allow your vulnerability and to accept your vulnerability it's just built into our individualism in our culture and it's costing us because bottom line is depression and anxiety are going through the roof you know and people are lonely as anything and we're building a society that has nothing to do with our basic needs if you look at um people who we think are of as wise um and who idealize they don't do that. I, I love the Dalai. I talk about him in my books. I've seen the Dalai Lama four times. And each time I've seen him, he mentions, someone asks him, what do you, well, what do you do? You know, you're this big spiritual figure that's supposed to have this emotional balance and you know, you've got it all together. You do mindfulness seven hours a day or something. So what do you do with your vulnerability and when you're upset, when you're angry, when you're, when you're scared? And this man, <laughs> I love it. This man says, um, whenever I'm upset and when I'm ever angry and he touches his chest, he says, I go inside and I, I feel my mother's love. Mm, nice. So listen to him. He says, I'm human, I get angry, I get afraid. He doesn't say, I'm so mindful, nothing puts me off balance, right? He, I, he, he said, I feel my mother's love because she loved me. He says, I feel it. He doesn't say, I have insight into it. He feels it in his body. He says, and it calms me down. And it gives me balance. And he talks about how we can live without meditation but, or and maybe even religion, but we can't live without human affection. And he says, I teach my monks when they are afraid or angry to call mother. But this is fascinating. Wow. I mean, yes, he's teaching. And from my point of view, John Bowlby, the father of attachment theory, would have loved that, right? But here's the Dalai Lama saying this, but but most of our culture is about, still about strength, is about being able to stand alone, whether you're male or female. Men and women come into our offices and they are ashamed of their attachment needs. And that's a cultural phenomenon. They are ashamed. And what we do in EFT is we validate those needs. We we don't teach people, we don't say, let me tell you about attachment, <laughs> right? But we, we use that frame all the time, you know, and we, um, whether I'm doing individual, I do it in individual therapy as well, or if I'm working with a family, 
you know, we use that frame of, hey, we're bonding mammals. We're bonding mammals. Your nervous system, when your brain was being formed, you knew that if you called and no one came, you were at risk not just at risk, but you were probably going to die, right? You knew that. That's wired into you. And somehow our culture has denied that. It's like at 12 years old, you're suddenly supposed to change your whole nervous system and not need anybody. This is nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. It's, But that's culturally kind of where we went. And I think we need, we need a correction. Something we really value at Lovelink is the ability to tune into our partners. This can be incredibly challenging between work, friends, television, and everything else life throws at us. It is completely natural to feel distracted and forget to focus in on the person we love most. Non is a sound meditation app for the iPhone that can help facilitate slowing down and connecting. Spelled N-O-N, it comes from the concept of non-duality, meaning not divided, oneness. What makes the Non app unique is that it isn't a collection of pre-recorded music. Instead, Non produces each sound note by note, making no two sessions ever alike. This lack of familiarity means you can approach each session unclouded by expectation, forever keeping your attention purely in the moment. Set the timer, sit with your lover, and meditate. Download Non today in the iPhone App Store. So once you get couples to feel safe in the room with you and and help them to feel like they can be vulnerable enough to share their fears and their worries, where where do you go from there? Once couples have an understanding of the dance that they've been in, the negative dances, what happens from there? Yes, that's a good question. Um, where you go from there is you go into you help them look at their cycle and how they're trapped by their cycle, right? You help them start to put in those underlying feelings that they never talk about. Like the man who shuts down and shuts his wife out, you help him start to talk about the moment before he shuts down. In the moment before he shuts down, there's a trigger. He's trying to avoid something. And you go into those emotions. And when we change the music, we turn the new, we, we use the new emotional music to change the steps. So rather than withdrawing and shutting down, we say, so can you help me? You take the emotion, you make it coherent and clear and simple. So what you're saying is that you turn away from your partner because you're so scared that you're going to hear that you don't please her and you can never please her, and that hurts. And he says, yes. <laughs> okay. Now he, and he says, well, I never quite put it together like that, and, but that is what it is, right? So he hasn't even formulated it that way, let alone told her. And I say, good, can you tell her, please? You turn the new emotion into a new signal to the partner. And so he tells her. And if that's scary for him, we'll talk about that. He says, no, I don't want to tell her. <laughs> well, of course, that's insane because he's, she's heard everything he said <laughs> to me. But it's not insane because he's saying, I don't want to engage with her on that level. right? So I say, mm-hmm. let's talk about the fact that you can tell me this, but it's somehow difficult even to just even think about turning and telling her this. He says, yes, that's right. I said, I understand. Could you turn and tell her, please? I, this is so difficult to talk about. I can't even turn and look into your face and tell you what I just said to Sue. And then we start there. So the bottom line is he turns and he takes a step towards openness and accessibility and emotional engagement. He takes a step. He turns and he says, I'm too scared. I shut down because I know what I'm going to see on your face. I'm going to see that look, that look. And he tells her what the trigger is, right? I'm going to see that look, which is, oh, you know, I'm never going to make it with you. I'm never going to make it with you. So you take the new emotion, 
the new music and you turn it into a, the first steps in a new dance. And then you help her respond to that. You say, what's it like for you to, to tell her that? He said, and people always say the same things, okay? We're, we're different, we're individuals, but we're not. We're, we're the same. <laughs> but people Predictable. Always, even something painful, people say, it feels good. It feels good because for the therapist to see my pain, help me understand it, order it for me, make sense of it for me, and hold me in it so I can tolerate it feels good, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of made sense of, of this thing that's overwhelming me. It's not overwhelming me. It, so people always say, it feels good. It feels good to be able to say that. That is what's real for me, right? So, and then you say to the other person, what's it like for you to hear this? And sometimes people struggle with it, but, you know, they get to a place where they can say, I never knew that. I hear that. And listen, their voice changes from da 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 da, -da. You are so different. You are you're at two. Oh, um, uh, oh, I, I never, oh, I didn't. You're afraid? You're afraid of me? Like, uh, really? Oh, um, oh, and you can, you see the fantastic thing in couples therapy is couples, you change the dance and then you watch couples, partners change each other. You actually see the new signal from the other person who's maybe been the withdrawer come across and the other, and this other partner start to take it in. And you see their brains struggling with this new perception <laughs> of their partner. And you see that their reactive knee-jerk angry response somehow doesn't fit anymore, but they don't know what to do now. <laughs> so you know, they, 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 they look at you and they say, oh, he's, um, he's scared of me. <laughs> and you say, yes, that's right. So you use, you develop and expand the emotion beyond the surface numbing or reactivity. You go into where people can talk about their softer feelings, their fears, right, their longings, their needs, and you bring that out in a constructive way in the relationship when they start to do a dance that's got more connection in it and where both people see each other in a, in a more real way, in an expanded way, and they start to be able to move into their vulnerability in a way that expands this. You're always going for moments of accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement in EFT, always because those are the key elements of a positive bond. So when I talk about this, I'm not talking about something that just feels good or that the therapist makes up on in a moment or, you know, that is kind of intuitive. I'm talking about a pattern in relationships that's supported by hundreds of bonding science studies you know, I'm talking about the fact that what I just said is true between a mother and a child. You know, a good relationship between a mother and child, the child will get upset for a moment, and if the child feels safe, the child will show that upset to the mother. Mm. And as the child shows the upset, the mother turns and tunes into the child and responds to the child with her face, with her voice, right, and goes with the child into the emotion so the child can order their feelings, they're not overwhelmed, and the mother's with the child and reaches for the child, connects for the child, and then everything calms down and the two people together start to dance, this engaged dance. Simone and I have talked about how sometimes what we've seen is that the pattern that's within the couple relationally is actually sometimes a different pattern than what you see in the couple in terms of their sex life. And sometimes it's the same. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that aspect. It can be the same. 
Um, you know, when I was talking about Danny just before, the pattern in his sex life was the same as the pattern in the, his whole relationship. He was always the pursuer. He was always vigilant for any rejection or abandonment, right? But the way he would pursue is he'd demand sex, right? So it, that was, that was, but in other couples, you get a withdrawer, usually the man, not always, but you get a withdrawer who will not approach on an emotional level, but will approach for touch and sex, right? That's the way they get soothed. And of course, after a while, the other person just starts to feel used, you know, and the, the sexuality, the relationship goes down the tubes. I think the thing is we haven't understood that in bonding mammals, sex is a bonding behavior. It's not just about release of tension or even about physical enjoyment. It's a bonding behavior. And certainly in EFT, I think our attachment frame helps us understand sexuality and helps us, you know, the evidence is a last study we did where we showed that people um, not just were not just more satisfied after EFT, they were more bonded, securely bonded after EFT, and those results stayed at follow-up. That study also found that even if you didn't talk to people about their sexuality, that the couples who experienced EFT and did homey type conversations, their sexuality improved. You know, because when I talk about the qualities of a good bond, emotional bond, accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement, those are exactly um, the qualities that make for an exciting, satisfying sex life, it seems to me. Ex accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement. If you're going on a zip line through a forest and you know you're safely tied in, you tug on the rope and the rope's there and you know you're safe, then you let go and the, you go on the zip line and you go, Wee! This is amazing, right? And it's like an orgasm, right? But if you tug on that line and you think, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, is there a chance that this line could actually like collapse in a moment and maybe I'm going to die and I'm going to be awfully careful here? There's no we. There's no we that happens. You're just, you know, it's like you're going to tolerate it, right? So safety, emotional safety brings out sexuality. It potentiates sexuality. All the research says securely attached folks, um, you know, have the best sex. They have it most often. They enjoy it most. That's what... So attachment science in some ways not only helps us understand love and understand what goes wrong in love and how to put it right, which is pretty amazing. It also helps us understand human sexuality, which is all tied up with bonding. So Sue, as we kind of end our interview with you, if you were to think about couples in distress in these negative dances, what's a piece of advice for them to just start to approach this dance, to start to think about it? I think the piece of advice is, it's, it's kind of like saying, I want people to know that, um, that romantic love makes sense that there's a, a survival it's survival script behind it, that you can understand it, and that once you understand it, you can have intentionality about it, that you can that that love doesn't have to be something you fall into, fall out of. It happens to you. No, it doesn't. I want people to know that love makes sense and that you can shape it. And you don't have to be overwhelmed by it and just give up on it. You know, that you can understand this incredible dance. And that this incredible dance is just as powerful and wonderful and important and significant and magical as, as any philosopher or poet ever said it was. This is the beautiful thing about this attachment science. It, it tells, it doesn't take the mystery and the amazingness out of love. It makes sense of love and it also says, yep, 
this is probably the most important thing in most people's lives. Yep. Yep. This is huge. But it, what it also says is, and you can have it. That's empowering advice. And that you can fall back in love. I think that's so huge because so many couples think that when they fall out of love, that that's it, that it's done. And I think what's so powerful about your model is that it's not just patching up bad behavior and reducing conflict, that it can really transform. It can bring love and romance and ignite a relationship again. And that's beautiful. Yeah. That's so glad you say that because this is my 30th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and- and, you know, we sat and last night and looked at some of our cards and letters that we've, because we're moving, we found this box with these cards and letters in and we sat, you know, and read some of the letters that we sent to each other. And it's so interesting because um, there are moments when I'll speak for myself. There are moments when I still feel that way, mm. right? It's like, it, it's different, of course. But because you've been with somebody for 30 years, but there, but yes, love is a renewable resource. It's a renewable res- It's the greatest resource of all. It's a, and it's a renewable resource and it's not intangible, fluffy, sentimental nonsense. It's a drama that happens between two people and it has powerful physiological impact on people, you know, and, yeah, you can fall in love again and again, and in different ways. Hmm. You know, you can fall in love because this person's your best friend who understands you best in the world and who sees things about you nobody else does. You can fall in love the next week with this person who suddenly looks like the sexiest thing you've ever seen in your whole life. (laughs) And you think, Oh, wow! You know, could you just see it that way a week before? I don't know why you didn't. You just didn't, right? Like, so, and then, well, suddenly you fall in love because, um, or what am I thinking? I'm thinking about the fact that a couple of years ago I got the Order of Canada, which in Canada is huge. It's this enormous award that the government gives to 100 people a year. Um who seem who feel they feel have improved public life in Canada and you know it was and I got it and I cried for about a week but the first thing that happened was I got it and I ran upstairs to tell my husband and he turned around and he looked at me and he said of course <laughs> and you know that was what I remember from that day, it was his validation. Mm. In the end, it's the validation of the people who love you. It, you. We're in love with fame and rewards, and that's all very nice. But, you know, in the end, it's the validation of the people who love you. So he, he didn't say, oh, wow, sweetie, that's amazing. He said, of course. Yeah. Right? And nice. that is, and so then you fall in love in another way. You know, you say, oh, but it's um anyway i've really got into this guys yeah thank you for sharing all your thank wisdom you. with us you're most welcome hope you enjoyed the podcast and thanks for listening We also want to thank Point and Passing for their original music and website design. Be sure to subscribe to Lovelink on iTunes and leave us a review. And check out our upcoming summer workshops for singles and couples on lovelink.co. See you next time.